Was it just teenage angst that led me down a path of rebellious self-indulgence? The kind only satisfied by stories of other edgy teenagers and creatures from beyond comprehension? Was my age the only factor in how much I bought into this time? Like, if I were to be as old as I am now, when I first heard the stories of Laughing Jack, Jeff the Killer, Slenderman, The Rake, would I not have enjoyed it the same? I am aware that my juvenile understanding of the world gave me the childlike ability to believe the unbelievable, to imagine the unimaginable and go for the idea that I might just be too weird for conventional entertainment. I ponder whether this time was truly special or just my own romanticizing of childhood memories. Do other people remember creepy pasta and the online horror boom of the early 2010s the way I do? Because I look back on this period with what some would consider rose-colored glasses. The thrill of finding a chilling new horror story is not new in history. However, there was an excitement for these stories that had become mainstream in our culture. This excitement is what inspired me to start writing my own scary stories and telling them in the form of short films at age 13. I refuse to believe I'm alone in this, though it seems to me that most people on YouTube that reflect on this time don't have much good to say about it. Continuously I hear how cringy it was, and how they're glad that it's over. Certainly there's validity to this epithet, yet does that make this time so untouchable that no one wants to be associated with it? In other words, does the cringe in hindsight outweigh the fun that came from it? When thinking about this, I'm reminded by the two types of people that I hear every now and again reflect on the 80s horror boom. Those who remember it for how much fun it was, and those who remember it for how cheesy it was. You could easily pick apart the 80s horror movies by focusing on the bad acting, or the laughable special effects, or even some of the inconsistencies in their storylines. But undeniably, there was a charm to these movies. Were they the best pieces of cinema? No. But they were organic and authentic. They were made by real human beings, some with more money than others, but with the intended purpose to entertain and have fun. When I think of creepypasta, I don't remember it for the lewd fan art of Jeff and Jane the Killer, or the bad writing. I remember it for the fun it brought to the internet. I remember it for the scary stories that we would read with our friends. I remember it for the new indie horror games that emerged. I remember it for the inspiration that was still left behind after it began to fade back into irrelevancy. I am grateful for this time to have happened and saddened by how short-lived it was. Surely Creepypasta was a teenage creation, but does that now discredit the impact that Creepypasta had on creating a new resurgence in mainstream horror? It has always been the teenagers that brought horror to the mainstream. In the 80s, it was no secret that horror was driven by teenage rebellion. John Carpenter was only 13 years old when he first wrote the score for Halloween. Sam Raimi had just turned 20 years old when filming first began on The Evil Dead. Think as far back as the 19th century, when Mary Shelley wrote her first draft of Frankenstein at only age 19. The concept of horror is typically always created in a youthful mind, obviously due to the reduced fear of death. I mean, when we're young, we are less likely to be confronted by our own mortality, so we act as if we are invincible. We think of fantastic horror stories as nothing but entertainment. Hardly do we believe any of it could actually happen to us. I believe creepypasta being driven by teenagers only strengthens my claim that we were on the verge of a great era in the history of horror, yet we let it get snuffed out by cynics. People that are critical of what I'll call the CPE, the creepypasta era, say that too many edgy teenagers took control of creepypasta and drowned out all the good stories with cringy Jeff the Killer replicas. I fail to see the issue here. I mean, I understand that Jeff the Killer was poorly written and that he cast a long shadow over everything creepypasta related, but to go so far as to ban any title from having the words The Killer in it, the way the forum did, alienated a lot of new creepypasta audience members and made them feel unwanted. This is when I believe people started losing interest. Maybe this was the beginning of the decline of Creepypasta. Rather than taking these characters to the next level, Creepypasta became embarrassed of itself and actively tried suppressing its own momentum. Could you imagine if this was done to Jason Voorhees? I mean, his origin story didn't make much sense. Yet, they continued to pump out these movies because it's what people wanted. 
Most creepypasta fans weren't worried about the inconsistencies in the story of Jeff. No, it doesn't make sense that 14-year-olds had handguns. No, it doesn't make sense that Jeff the Killer's skin was lit on fire by bleach and was burned white. Just like it doesn't make sense that Jason Voorhees was living at the bottom of Crystal Lake as a zombie child for a decade, then shows up in the second movie, a day apart from the first movie, as a full-grown man. Look, they just wanted to have fun. And now the young people that made Creepypasta so big are the people blamed for its demise. I think given enough time, we might have seen Jeff organically be replaced by a new story, had this not have happened. Ironically, Jeff the Killer was never the most well-known creepypasta anyways. That title goes to the tall, faceless, Lovecraftian creature with tendrils that lured children from their beds at night, known as Slenderman. I remember watching all the Marble Hornets tapes as they came out. I played all the different variations of the Slender game. I even made a Slenderman documentary on this channel back in 2013. I mean, it didn't get many views in comparison to much larger channels, but for a channel with less than a thousand subscribers, it was a hit. Sadly, we all know what happened in 2014, and I believe that was the true nail in the coffin for the CPE. I'm obviously talking about the Slenderman stabbing. This caused parents to get involved, creepypasta was already on a decline, and this tragedy took the last of the fun out of it. Slenderman was later turned from an urban legend into just another Hollywood cash grab, and the charm faded. Since then, we have had the clown sightings of 2016, the Momo challenge in 2019, which were fun, but both ended with tragedies similar to the Slenderman stabbing. We were having people in clown masks getting jumped by groups of people for their really harmless antics, and children killing themselves in the name of the Momo challenge. Even at their peaks, these things couldn't capture the feeling of the cultural phenomena that was creepypasta. These stories came from faceless users on the internet. If something spooky happened in your life, you could tell your story on a platform, play it up to whatever level you wanted, and we as the creepypasta listeners or readers were enticed into your world by the mere speculation that there might be some validity to the stories we heard. We wanted to believe, even though we knew the stories were almost all certainly fiction. It was like believing in Bigfoot. Even though all the odds were stacked against you, you still wanted to believe. It was fun to believe. You wanted to believe. My favorite creepypasta of all time is that of the expressionless. Because I have friends that swear on the legitimacy of the story today. Even though it's just an urban legend, the idea that some claim they know someone who saw the woman or were there when she walked into the hospital covered in blood keeps the story alive today. This fine line between fiction and reality is the very essence of the wonder that Creepypasta brought us.